I'm even happier to say that 19th century periodicals and the visual culture they encourage are the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. These days, that pot is more accessible than ever. Whole runs of periodicals founded before, during, and after the Civil War have become digitized, each filled with startling texts of all sorts, plus ready context for reading them. Digitized runs mean efficient word searching instead of laborious page turning, with killer graphics available online gratis. In addition, many archives now offer free scanning from undigitized sources which saves wear and tear while opening vast troves to interlibrary loan requests. Where book loans, historical societies, and scholarly associations have also scanned materials for online catalogs, treasures that are now just a Google search away. As a result, the question for students of periodical literature is no longer a dismissive, but is it any good? More often, it's an enticing, Good for what? So let's take that question, good for what? And consider new ways of seeing, beginning with this engraving of parlor ornaments. The image comes from Godey's Ladies Book, a Philadelphia monthly that was founded in 1830, read for its top drawer literature by men and women, and thriving by 1860. With a record number of subscriptions, Godey's could afford its signature engravings, some of them colored like this one by hand. It's worth adding that 19th century American periodicals were generally available in reading rooms and taverns, aboard ship in the captain's quarters, even thrown from mail trains to soldiers in camp during the Civil War. But most of the time, subscribers read their pages in parlors whose ornaments hinted at the disposable income and the leisure time that periodical subscriptions also required. For literate middle-class families, sometimes reading aloud, parlors were a refuge. So you have to wonder what they were a refuge from. Arguably, that was everything outside the curtain window in an increasingly mechanized age on increasingly trafficked streets but beginning in 1861, that was more specifically the war in the United States, which for periodical subscribers was less a house divided than a house invaded by shells and troops for some, by news bulletins and casualty reports for many more. This wood engraving is actually a Fort Sumter in the Charleston Harbor during South Carolina's artillery attack on April 12, 1861. Candidly, this image was the only cover option that two co-editors could agree on for a collection of 20 essays about the Civil War's differing visions of glory and the well-equipped North, the beleaguered South, and the struggle of African Americans to be free. The cover is also a reminder that you may prefer your graphics with a little color, like the engravings in Godey's Ladies Book which is a cinch if you have a good art department or you know your way around highlighting because class discussions can be further juiced by intriguing, an intriguing question. Here's one for today. What were periodical readers first invited to see in the Civil War's explosive intrusions? Let's concentrate on periodical short fiction, which is often set aside for novels but turns out to be a godsend, even in college classrooms. Faster read, more variety, greater opportunity to add images of your choosing, because short fiction was almost never illustrated. In mid-century periodicals, engravings tended to accompany news reports, or novel installments, or travel sketches. Great, more room for you to be creative. To make finding such fiction easy, there's a list in your handout of the 31 stories I've collected in To Live and Die, with links to free online copies. All but one of the link sites allows for printing, so you have to do it page by page. And the, the one reminds me that the whole collection is now available for free online reading from archive.org or from thrift books for less than seven bucks. If, as you'll discover, if you're curious, 
Each story in that volume appears with an image or two from an illustrated news magazine, most often Harper's Weekly. Illustration sources are provided at the back of the book. For us, a good place to begin might be Hopeful Tackett, his mark. It's an early story that was written by an Illinois private named Richmond Walcott and published in Boston's Continental Monthly, which was an anti-slavery magazine deeply committed to the Union and to the Republican Party of Abraham Lincoln. Walcott opens with a village cobbler or cobbler's apprentice singing the Star Spangled Banger the way most of us do, though the spelling on the page looks weird. Almost immediately in Wilcott's tale, the cobbler's apprentice uh, is wounded in a skirmish and his leg is amputated, but he returns home and without fuss marries his sweetheart. What's a story like Hopeful Tackett good for? It's generous measure of down-home heroism during the war's first year, even after the horrific casualties at the Battle of Shiloh for Pittsburgh Landing in Tennessee just a few months earlier. Tackett's Western generosity is caught in the lilt of his colloquial speech, and then his sweetheart's praise for his honorable mark, that stump of a leg. There's also a little more to see, as a few useful contrasts will reveal. What would happen if you couple Wolcott's story with this Harper's Weekly illustration? The Great Uprising of the North which stages an imagined and symbolic celebration of Union patriotism a year after Fort Sumter fell. As the artist observes in his commentary, the hearty sons of New England swarm over the hills, joining their brothers of the middle states, swelling as they meet the mighty current setting in from the far off states of the Pacific and the glorious West. He notes the smoke from Fort Sumter which here frames the Capitol in Washington and its tribute to liberty and union. On the upper right, the artist points to Boston's Bunker Hill Monument, recalling the devotion of the country's founders that counters the dark Southern skies on the right. With this visual tribute to the free North as backdrop, the singing cobbler begins to stand for more than his Western village. Having already received the great uprising where Wilcott's story appeared, any of the news magazine readers who also subscribed to the Continental Monthly could see in him the principles of Bunker Hill, along with the vigor that would conquer secession and its fatal assault on the Union. More than a cheerful scene of duty, Hopeful Tackett stands in for son the Sons of Liberty and their imperative self-defense. Predictably enough, you're thinking. And yet look what happens when you pair hopeful tech at his mark with another story, a practice that makes it easier to see, perhaps even to notice details that might get missed. Published in the December 1861 issue of the Southern Monthly in Memphis, a true and simple tale of 61 is also a story of national allegiance, early enlistment and painful sacrifice. Here copied from To Live and Die, since this is the magazine story with no direct link. It's a great choice today for its peculiarities. The Southern Monthly was a short-lived but venomous literary magazine that took aim at the infectious abolitionism of Northern periodicals. The contrast with Hopeful Taggart or Sharp, Zilda's tale opens at a mansion in Mississippi State Capitol and substitutes the glitter of a wedding on the night before secession for a humble, humble cobbler's bench. In Mississippi, the fight for liberty protects the home and rights of freeborn men who can afford the wedding's diamonds and pearls, especially as the state defies a union despot who is worse than a monarch. While both stories invoke the revolution and the republic they intend to safeguard, there's no Bunker Hill in this true and simple tale. Instead, an author with a pen name sees secession supporting the great cause of constitutional liberty, which the state's elite at the story's mansion are bound to defend, but Wilson's stu a Wilcox story never mentions. Here's what the reborn fight for national independence look like in the Illustrated London News where this portrait of General Stewart and his cavalry 
appeared early in the war. Frank Vizzatelli, the Englishman who served as the ILN's artist correspondent covering the Civil War in America, was initially posted to the North. But when he was denied further travel on US government transports after he drew and mocked the Union route at Bull Run, he slipped across the lines into Virginia, where he started reporting on Southern independence and the colossal revolution the Confederacy was waging. This was his first illustration of a determined South, and he went on to offer the best pictorial coverage of the Confederacy, whose officers routinely provided their own maps as the Union cavalry did not. The Illustrated London News, founded in 1842, was generally sympathetic to the class-bound social hierarchies of the patriarchal South, and Visitelli certainly was. Because the wartime pages of this news weekly are now available online for free, it would be easy for your students to see who took up the great cause of constitutional liberty and who then stood to benefit. Not cavalers, but the elite. Not cheerful volunteers, but splendid patriots. Where Wolcott describes a village shop, Isilda favors a mansion's diamonds and pearls as well as the leadership that Southern elites would continue to provide. Her story actually ends lamentably with battlefield death and the responsibility of widows to serve as nurses. Along the way, there's no infectious dialogue, but instead a well-heeled social world that would enable, in Visitelli's phrase, the finest irregular body of horse in the world. If your chief aim and making room for the Civil War under lesson plan is to offer a glimpse of whose liberty mattered and what early volunteers believed they were fighting for in the spirit of 1776. These two stories with two well-chosen illustrations could give you much to discuss in no time. Still, there are other options, particularly as the events of the war continue to unfold. Perhaps you're more interested in the fate of a warrior as casually this grew longer. Let's take a look at a story titled On the Antietam, which was published anonymously like most stories in Harper's Weekly, just a few months after that crucial battle in mid-September 1862. Founded in 1857, the New York Illustrated Weekly was fervently unionist and produced the most impressive war coverage that readers had ever known, which sent its northern circulation soaring. Both of today's mid-war stories come from Harper's Weekly, which published more than 100 stories during the course of the war. On the Antietam carries into battle the schoolboy grudges that festered beneath or between backstreeters and ours, the Manhattan boys who are expensively dressed and viciously condescending. But there is a wrinkle. The hopeful tactic of this tale is the leader of the bullies, in the Antietam woods, he crosses paths again with the back street leader now intent on revenge as a rebel soldier backed by a Southern uncle's fortune. The story then takes two unexpected turns. In the first of these, the back streeter with a fine rifle and excellent aim suddenly dies from a random shot, a chance bullet. That suits the historical significance of the battle, Antietam or Sharpsburg was the bloodiest single day of the war with more than 20,000 casualties, a day so horrible that even the birds would disappear until the following spring. So discussing this story nearly begs for one of the news magazine's battlefield engravings that the story's readers had already encountered. For instance, scenes of the battlefield of Antietam, a composite double image that was printed in October before the story appeared in January. As the news magazine notes, the scenes were taken from photographs made on the battlefield. But you can see their tiny arrangement was designed to frame the picturesque arches of Burnside's Bridge and look less like traumatic witness than like a summons to tourists. The impression, that impression was further encouraged by the process of turning photographs into drawings and then illustrations. Wood engraving is inexpensive to produce and easy to incorporate on magazine pages that also include print. But the medium is shallow and requires creating the illusion of depth. 
you can spot how that's done in the corner of the spread at the bottom left. Here, the photograph's row of body has become a gentle curve, which carries the eye past tufts of grass to the mid-ground trees and the distant ridge, all beneath the conventional and busy sky. If the visual formula that would become today's, it's the visual formula that would become today's postcard assembly designed to lure you into the picture space and onto the path or the river or the gentle curve into the distance. Voila, instant depth of field. Here's the photograph that Harper's artist drew. Alexander Gardner's gathered together for burial after the Battle of Antietam. See how the curve of bodies was once mismatched clothing, gaping flesh and naked faces. What's been called the brutal inertness of death. In the face of photography's stark reductions, battlefield valor was still possible and even desirable for the special artists in the field who used the clash of troops and weapons to deepen the illusion of space in their drawings. Put another way, the hand-to-hand -hand fighting that carries the schoolyard bully past a perfect hornet's nest would have made him the gallant darling of a battlefield sketch. But the chance bullet that kills the back streeter is the stuff of photographic jolt. What's on the Antietam good for? Shoving readers into the contrast between a wood engraving's glory and a photograph's brutal inertness, which the war's competing visual technologies forced wartime spectators to negotiate. That's the first twist on the Antietam introduces. The second is that the Southerner bent on revenge is a sharpshooter. He's been up a tree and drawing a bead on the bully, much like Winslow Homer's A Sharpshooter on Picket Duty. As an illustrator and painter who visited the Virginia front several times, Homer knew how to create the illusion of pictorial depth through a dangling canteen, a bent knee, a projecting branch. Show this news magazine page to your students and they'll be quick to imagine the vengeful Southerner's telescopic sight his careful aim, his angry purpose. Homer himself was unsettled, as he reported in a later letter. I looked through one of their rifles once, he wrote, and the impression struck me as being as near to murder as anything I ever could think of. Show your students the painting that Homer soon completed, and they may be further horrified by its rich greenery, which makes the sharpshooter's poise seem natural and appealing. Does that make a chance bullet and a random death just as appealing or even more horrific, like Gardner's inert and agonizing photograph? Consider pairing the Harper's Weekly story with another, Colonel Charlie's Wife, which was published late in 1864 with an unexpected twist of its own. Also set in the hills of Northern Virginia and nearby Maryland, the story trades open battle for guerrilla skirmishing, specifically the threat to Union troops posed by the guerrilla rangers of John Singleton Mosby. A Union detachment has just concluded that the threat is over when a dawdling soldier in the rear shouts, look out boys, Mosby is after us, full chisel. The Union men are stuck in a railroad cut alongside a ridge. Somebody has to climb up to the ridge and run in plain sight to the camp three miles away. Here's the twist. The first to volunteer is a quiet loner who turns out to be, shocker, a girl. While a cross-dressing soldier may sound like woke culture on a tear, it turns out that 500 to 1,000 women enlisted during the Civil War. Women like Sarah Rosetta Wakeman, alias Private Lion Wakeman, a volunteer who called himself as independent as a hog on ice. In Colonel Charlie's wife, that volunteer runner is spotted and wounded, but she makes it to camp and sends help. You can guess that treating her wound reveals her secret, as well as her love for the officer she will marry. She's a hopeful tacket who keeps both feet on the ground before marrying. That big reveal in 1864 is certainly worth discussing. And so is the gathering evidence that the Civil War's women didn't simply stand and wait. Those who didn't enlist sewed for their regiments, organized fairs to raise funds, and above all, 
nursed. It's tempting to see such activities as energetic but comfortably feminine, like Louisa May Alcott's brief stint as a hospital nurse in Washington and Georgetown. But quite a few commentators have noticed that one of the images later added to her fictionalized hospital sketches, first published in 1863, hints at more remarkable ambitions. She's sympathetic and gentle with John, the manliest among my 40. But in this image, thought to be drawn by a female illustrator and Alcott's friend, Nurse Periwinkle nonetheless stands above her dying patient. In fact, she's level with the face of Lincoln, just below God. No smitten private soon to marry her heart's desire. She instead takes up quite a bit of image space, like an outsized U.S. in the other posted drawing. Nuts to hopeful Tackett. In full command, she's more Colonel Charlie than his bride. Still, Colonel Charlie's wife is good for closing the gap between home front and battlefield, for suggesting how much of a home the war soldiers tried to make their camps or hospital wards, and for providing an opening to discuss how far the Civil War women he served outstripped later Rosie the Riveters, enough to bring back the valor that sharpshooters and photographers did. That's for your students to decide. What these several stories have so far left out is the African-American struggle for freedom, which can still find a place in your classroom through two final pieces of short fiction. While no periodical story I've discovered is indisputably written by an African-American author, some are close and tantalizing, like buried alive. A Harper's, Weekly, a Harper's Weekly tale that appeared in May of 1864 is a dramatic account of the slaughter at Fort Pillow along the Mississippi River in Tennessee. The attack by Confederate cavalry occurred in mid-April and is here made gripping as a first person narrated by a black soldier who was shot twice and then tossed with scores of others into a ditch, half buried, and then left to die in a living grave. As he puts it, I thought I could feel the worms gnawing at my flesh. Unlike so many others at Fort Pillow, white and black, who were brought down by Confederate swords and carbines, this soldier crawls past the dead or dying and is eventually brought to safety for treatment. The story ends with a thirst for revenge against the whole slaveholders' rebellion and an unsent letter from a dead friend to his wife, a letter with no trace of dialect. In fact, nobody in the story speaks anything but standard English, which reads as a measure of respect and vindication. That verbal dignity would only have added to the shock as details of the attack on Fort Pillow spread across the North. What the story calls an indiscriminate massacre reportedly occurred under a Confederate flag of truce, which led black and white regiments in the Union bastion to stop firing and permitted Confederate leaders to charge and enter the fort. With no hope of further resistance, Union soldiers laid down their weapons and were savagely executed. That's what Harper's Weekly illustrated. A week before the story appeared, look at how black soldiers and their white officers are placed in the lower right, not only closer to readers and their sympathy, but also in the wood engraving's foreground to allow for greater detail. By contrast, Confederates occupy the midground and then become little more than demonic shadows toward the rear. What catches the eye are the white blasts from Confederate rifles and the sharp points of bayonets that fueled Northern revenge, exactly what this story was meant to inspire. It may be useful to know how Black Union volunteers were customarily seen. By 1864, Confederate President Jefferson Davis had declared that captured black soldiers would not be exchanged, but sold into slavery or executed. The result, maimings, deaths, and broken families, but also the opportunity to earn Northern respect for such dangerous service. By midsummer, a few weeks after the atrocities at Fort Pillow, this is how Harper's Weekly pictured an enslaved man in Alabama escaping to enlist in the United States Colored Troops. What Lincoln cast as emancipation in 1862 had become, for this magazine at least, 
the birthright of freedom, hard earned. What's very alive, good for? Demonstrating that Northern war aims had been transformed since Southwell Packett's embrace of union and flag. In the wake of Fort Pillow and a larger land of the free, Harper's Weekly praised this new volunteer fighting for the nation which is hereafter pledged to protect him and his. It was a pledge that African Americans seeking to vote would remember in the aftermath of the Civil War. Think that African American men, black women did not fare as well during or after the war, even if they had become laundresses traveling with Union troops. Although they could fight successfully for a pension due to their service, full recognition for black women as citizens remained elusive. Or so it seems in an unusual story by Constance Fenimore Wilson, grandniece of James Fenimore Cooper. Published a decade after the war ended, Wilhelmina was set near Cleveland at Door, a German separatist community that was built on nonviolent violent principles. In the rolling Ohio countryside, the insular social experiment was secluded from the outside world, except for trade, a Republican hatred of slavery, and this story reveals the quiet enlistment of several young Zora men in the 107th Ohio Volunteer Infantry. Wilson's story appeared in Boston's prestigious Atlantic Monthly, still alive today, and committed from its first issue in 1857 to liberty and an anti-slavery agenda. The story follows Wilson's title character, a seemingly adopted daughter who has been grafted and not a shoot from a community stock. In a sea of blonde German girls who work the community's extensive farm, Wilhelmina is described as a brown changeling with a Nubian head, dark braids, and somewhat heavy Egyptian features, a bird of the tropics who has promised herself to Gustav, one of the young volunteers. When the Zorman are finally mustered out after their three-year enlistments, their homecoming is as exuberant as that of the veteran volunteers Harper's Weekly Honor in 1864. As you can probably tell, this swirling image was not taken from a photograph, but drawn for the woodblock, in this case by the head of the Harper Art Department, Charles Parsons. In its diverging lines, his rendering is, is a, as animated as Zora's late night welcome and Gustav's merriness. But these pictured veterans already go their separate ways, and so did the Zora men back from a wider world. Most return to their families and the girls they left behind. Late summer, we'll see a mass marriage that includes Wilhelmina, though she does not wed the man she loves. Gustav has departed forever to marry Miss Martin of Cincinnati. Her gilt jewelry anticipates the post-war Gilded Age, already in progress when Wilson published her story in 1875, just as Gustav's departure anticipates the decline of Zora when too many of its brightest spirits moved away. Abandoned in a forsaken past, Wilhelmina is married off to Jacob the baker and dies within the year. What is this story good for? The hard lesson that grafting new shoots on the community stocks would prove difficult and far more intricate than passing a new constitutional amendment through Congress. That's one lesson. And there's another tickled by a small detail Wilhelmina's Nubian head, a reference to the kingdom of Nubia or Kush, now southern Egypt and northern Sudan. This fleeting nod is easy to miss, but was once made resonant by magazines and the alluring visual culture of the later 19th century, like Filippo Baratti's In the Harem, with its Nubian, Nubian singer stories. Leaning into the post war American vogue for Middle Eastern Seraglios produces a striking difference in how Wilson's story of Ohio is read. Because Wilhelmina appears to be black, she raises questions about whose freedoms would be most pressing in a reconstructed nation. More specifically, because she appears to be Nubian, she suggests a hybrid alternative to racial divisions in the mixing and mingling of North Africa, an alternative that fails when Gustav leaves Wilhelmina with a broken heart. Most significantly, because Wilhelmina appears to be exotic, like noon in the tropics when the gorgeous flowers flame in the white shadowless heat, as Wilson puts it. 
her tale offers an exotic spin. The result is that a sentimental story of young love fading becomes a meditation on social difference. At the time, that meant the fate of freed people and the social priorities of the anti-slavery North, whose hearts and minds were only slowly grasping what was possible after winning a war for liberty and justice. That's going some for a single short story in a single short class where discussion can readily take off. And here's something else. You now have at your fingertips some 31 stories of the Civil War, uh, as well as where to find them. It's certainly possible to mix and match those stories as I have here in any way that suits your um, class priorities or for that matter, different classes. But to tell the truth, 30 some stories, I'm about to annotate more than 300. So 30 some stories, it's chicken feed. If there's a particular kind of Civil War story, say a story about Southern refugees, whole families of Southern refugees, or Gettysburg, or just about anything Louisa May Alcott wrote about the Civil War, feel free to drop me a line. Stay in touch. I'm happy to oblige. Thanks so much. <laughs>